All right, I think I'm ready. So Hayden, Scott, are you around? Hello. Hello, so I'm going to turn on my video as well. So magic can start happening right in front of us. Everybody can hear me? Yeah. Excellent, Scott. Uh, I can't see Hayden for some reason. Oh, I can see Hayden. Oh, well, Hayden is always born ready, I guess. I said I was muted. Am I muted uh, now? No, I think no. I think we're good now. All right. So let okay. me just double check everything. Okay, so I think we can actually start. So I'm going to click that button for our dear friends on Zoom who are joining us as well. Are you ready to hit that button? Yeah, that sounds like some people. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to click on the broadcast button. Three, two, one, and we're going live. Oh, here we go. Hello, uh, everybody. Hello, uh, everyone. Hi. Uh, it's myself, Scott, here from Canada, and we have um, Hayden Pickering joining us today for the presentation, the author of the new Inclusive Components book that was just released today. And uh, as always, we have Vitaly here. Yay. Yes. Yes, I'm so excited today. I have no idea. I, I didn't sleep the entire day just for this session because I'm so excited. No, that's not true. <laughs> that's not why you weren't sleeping. <laughs> no, but I, I, I'm very, very excited, actually. So, Hayden, how are you doing today? I'm very well, yeah. Um, I got a, uh, a latex goat's head in the mail, as you can, you can see in the top right-hand corner there. So I'm happy with that. I've played some bass uh um fixed a couple of bugs and that's it and there's been no fireworks i didn't really like fireworks and there hasn't been any so far this evening so i'm happy what are you going to use the goat's head for just decoration well, uh <laughs> yeah well i'm i mean first of all i'm going to perform some satanic rites obviously um but uh also i think uh, what i'd like to do at some point is is a presentation or like a, a conference talk where um, because I'm building a drum machine, I'd like someone to actually uh, dance along to some of the rhythms that I'm creating. And I thought it would be nice if they danced along to them. Whilst dressed as Satan, I thought okay. that would be kind of, or Baphomet to be more technically correct. Fair enough. Well, maybe we should actually, you know, there are many interesting things we need to know, or we might not need to know about Hayden. <laughs> um, I think it would be very really interesting to explore the dark side later. Before that, <laughs> we can actually move on to the bright side of things. Mm. Um, and, you know, for me personally, um, I think it's been a very good year. The last two years were kind of really, really good because I realized that accessibility has become a major part of web development, full mm. stop. Right? So I remember vividly those fights that we would have in some chats or blog posts every now and again, maybe five, seven years ago. Yeah. Where people would say, well, you know, my business case is, you know, I don't have to worry about 0.0, .0 whatever percent of people and you know maybe we should be taking care about the majority first and i feel like at this point right now um accessibility has become a uh, default and i'm really really happy about this do you see mm. it the same way hayden or is it is it just me you know um imagining things i i think that the 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 narrative in general has changed i think you're right and i think um i actually think that smashing magazine has had a hand in that because obviously Smashing Magazine has a, a very large following and you've done your best to um, make accessibility part of the, the wider discourse about design and coding. And, uh, and I've obviously been part of that as well, having published books with you previously too. And that's been, I think that's been good. I mean, obviously there's been a lot of people who've been plugging away at it for a long time. And uh, we're only making a, a, you know, we're only adding our small little bit, you know, standing on the shoulders of giants and whatnot. But, um, but yeah, I think, um, I think it is shifting to the point where now it's more difficult to get away with ignoring it because culturally um, we look out for it and we, we, um, we started to sort of um, have it in our mind um when we're making things a bit more which is really good to see yeah 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 so i'm looking forward to see what you have to say today uh and <laughs> dear friends dear members dear friends who just come to 
the smashingmagazine.com website who likes cats and apparently also the red color. Um, well, the, the way we're going to do it is this. So in the past, we used to have webinars which were kind of only available for members, uh, Smashing members, and we'd like to open it up to get as much exposure and to make the content accessible to everybody, right? Um, and at the same time, we also want to provide uh, members with an opportunity to ask questions directly. And maybe, um, you know, if Hayden has time after the session, just answer a couple of questions that you might have in terms of, you know, how to build that particular component, make it a bit more accessible, these kind of things. But this session today in general is all just about kind of looking into where we stand in terms of accessibility and, um, you know, what we need to do next and also, how do we connect the dots? I mean, we all talk about accessibility being a part of our job, but at the same time, uh, personally, I see many people struggling trying to make it a part of the workflow, right? Mm. Make it really a routine thing, right? And uh, I'm very happy to have Hayden with us today. Um, but before Hayden starts with a short 20, 30 minutes session? Something like that. I'm not okay. sure. It'll be, yeah, it'll be in, in that area. Right. If, if I go on for too long, then you can tell me to shut up. I won't be offended. Sure. Uh, but then please do stick around and ask questions and we'll bring them all up. How much time it's going to take, whatever time it takes, right, Hayden? Yes. Oh, wow. That was a really good yes. Uh, and we'll, we'll be uh, kind of covering your questions, of course, uh, as well. Um, and while we are on it, you know, just so we don't feel alone here in this one Wonderful, wonderful live stream. Can you tell us where you're from in the chat? You know, it's nice when you see actually somebody behind on the other side of the screen. Hmm. So if you could just type where you're from, mm, nobody likes typing. Maybe everybody's cooking and so, so. Hmm. Oh, Berlin, Russia, Georgia, San Francisco, Ottawa, Chicago, Austin, wow, Denver, Finland, Budapest. Wow, this is just unbelievable. So cool. <laughs> Like, look at all these wonderful people joining us today. I oh, should be so talking excited. about internationalization instead, shouldn't I? Oh, maybe next time. Yeah. Maybe next time. <laughs> uh, with this in mind, dear friends, thank you so much for joining. Uh, well, we, know we haven't finished yet. Uh, I'd like to hand over at this point to Hayden uh, mm. to do some magic, explain a little bit about, um, oh, I didn't sleep today at all. So <laughs> do your thing. Hayden, please save me, save me. And then okay. I'll be back. Okay, visually, old friend, I'll, I'll step in and try and make sense of things. Um, so can you see my screen? Does it say inclusive yes. components? Yeah, okay. So, so inclusive components, I suppose the clue is in the name. Um, it's about creating components which are inclusive. Um, and it's the name of the third book or resource or thing that I've done with Smashing Magazine now. Uh, started off with one called Apps for All, um, which was an ebook, And then Vitaly approached me um, sometime after that was released and said, hey, let's update this and turn this into a print book, which I was very excited about. But then I, but by that time, because, you know, as things move so fast in front end development and in web design, I kind of wanted by then to do a write a different book. So that became inclusive design patterns. And now we are here with inclusive components. And it's kind of perhaps more than previous books or in more detail uh, deals with the relationship between accessibility and design systems. I think when I started to um, contribute to the blog that was um, the original format for inclusive components, design systems were just becoming very ascendant, they were becoming a, a major concern, a mainstream concern. And the relationship between the two things is something that I wanted to kind of um, dissect because um, creating a design system which is inaccessible is obviously a problem, but also I think we need to think systematically about the way that we approach accessibility too. It's not just a, a box checking thing, it's, it's about a cultural thing and, and what have you. Uh, I specifically uh, focus on interaction design. So it's not just about the way things uh, look, it's, it's, it's mostly about um, uh, components which are interactive and, and how those components behave when you interact with them and how you can make them behave in an accommodating and accessible way. And uh, then the idea is that you would, you would create components which are as inclusive as possible. It's not like an on-off 
switch you can't just make things accessible or not accessible it's usually bending towards being accessible and inclusive or not so much um, it's either you put the effort in or you don't but um pattern libraries which have um components which where you've actually thought about accessibility in some detail so if you're not familiar with design systems and you probably should be because alec Armatova wrote a book for smashing magazine about design systems which is a very good book um little plug for you there vitally on that side but um the idea is that you would just design a component or a pattern in one place and then that can be propagated around your um your product or your multiple products or your multiple interrelated conglomerate organizations or what have you the idea is that it's dry you don't repeat yourself you just get it right once and then you just reuse it so the idea is that you create efficiency and uh, consistency and the problem is that on the other hand i mean that ideally that would be a good thing but on the other side if you were to create a rubbish component in the first place then you'll actually be propagating badness everywhere um and accessibility because the knowledge and tool quite recently as we were discussing has been lacking is usually where that happens so in a way if it's bad in a consistent way then at least um you can say that um people will will be able to work out where you've made mistakes and 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 find workarounds for themselves so it's that's better than it being uh you know a one part of the website being bad in one sense and then another version of the same component somewhere else being bad in another sense because that would be more complex and more confusing but what would be better than making something consistently bad would of course be making something consistently good and in terms of uh, accessibility um stopping this happening is usually considered a huge investment. Um, it's seen as being something where you have to invest a lot of time and a lot of resources in, into it. And so we try and create these um, teams of people around trying to uh, adopt a design process, an inclusive design process, which means that um, the end products or the components which we lend towards the end product are of a higher quality in terms of accessibility. Um, that's very involved and it, in it, in it um, uh, combines a lot of different uh, approaches. So first of all, you need to recruit people who would first of all have a good understanding of accessibility. Um, in my experience, people who specialize in CSS and HTML tend to be folks who um, are well versed in accessibility and things like semantic HTML and stuff, the basic sort of code based stuff. Um, so having people like that on your team is a good thing. Always good if you've got a huge team of people to have people which have um, different perspectives and different um, experience. It's no good hiring lots of the same person. So diverse teams uh, is sort of related to that subject too. You'd want to have um, people who can bring something different to the table. Um, and I found that lots of organizations you'd have say a um, a load of full stack developers and by full stack developers we usually mean people who have more experience more interest in kind of back-end stuff and, and uh, system stuff and api stuff and less uh, experience or interest possibly because of a sort of computer science background in interaction design and actually where the interface meets the person so it's good to have some people who, who are good at that kind of stuff but also some people who are good at um the interface bits as well all people who are coders as well like it's it's silly to uh, to divide things in terms of designers and coders because coders have a, a diverse um, way of doing things too um and of course uh training is important too so if you want to get people up to speed in the organization then you'd want to uh actually set up some training sometimes i'm asked to do um internal workshops and that kind of thing uh to get a team of folks to maybe say design their own components and then test each other's components and go through that whole process and go through the inclusive design and coding process and of course you want to commission research and the research participants should be as diverse as your team they should be people who use different devices come from different backgrounds um not everyone should be english as a first language 
people should uh, you should uh, include people who rely more heavily on using a keyboard than a mouse and uh, and use different assistive technologies, different things that they plug into the browsers and the computers that they're using, like screen readers and that kind of thing. But this is a huge undertaking. Um, and it's something that you should do, especially if you have the resources. But actually, it's only really um, necessary when you're breaking new ground and you're creating new kinds of interface. And actually, a lot of the time when we're working on the web, we're not doing that. And it's probably wise a lot of the time not to, um, because we should be leaning on established conventions. What should be innovative and what should be um, the kind of thing which excites users should be the content and the, and, the, and the functionality, not the way that we create the functionality. We shouldn't be um, reinventing things so much there because it's only going to confuse people. So one of the ideas around inclusive components and, and also the, the predecessor inclusive design patterns was that um, you can quite easily identify common things that we all use as an industry. Um, it's just that we variously in different ways tend to make those things badly. So what I wanted to do was to say, OK, so we all use this thing. So, for instance, something like whatever you call this. And this appears in lots of our interfaces in different places. We all make or use things like this. What's like what are all the things that we should all be thinking of as we're making it um, to make sure that it is inclusive, that it's understandable and that it's um, easy to use in different ways and it's multimodal and all of that good stuff. Um, because once you've actually established all of that, then you can make that one component, not just that one component for your organization, but the one component uh, in the abstract, which could be used across different companies. So that's why I wanted to write this stuff, I suppose. So this thing is, um, you know, in your design system, it might be called a more info or something like that might be the name of the component because it's a way for users to get more info or it might be called a knowledge panel if you're a little bit um, more verbose and slightly pretentious or um, it might be called Pandora's box. I don't know. It could it could have any number of different names and be talked about in different ways based on its actual purpose. But the actual interface, regardless of the purpose and, and what you're trying to achieve and what information you are hiding and then uh, disclosing, is it's just a, a very simple, ordinary pattern, um, which as an industry, we sometimes call a disclosure um, or sometimes an accordion, especially if those uh, the individual um, open close thingies are um, used um, one after the other as a group. Uh, sometimes that's an accordion. I tend to call it a collapsible. And in the book, I talk about collapsibles quite a bit. Um, and it's important to just approach trying to design and code these things with inclusion in mind and inclusion in a broad sense. So making sure it's accessible, technically accessible, and usually that means making it uh, adapt to and conform with different ways of uh, being used, but also just broadly, um, can it be uh, understood and used by the broadest number of people? Um, so what I've done for the purpose of this talk, and this is slightly experimental, is I've done a version of collapsible things. Um, so you can see them on the right hand. This is just code pen. You can see them on the right hand side of my screen. I've got these two collapsibles. Uh, one which is called section one and the next section two. I'll get onto how bad my copy is and how you shouldn't use lorem ipsum really uh, in a little while. But um, there's, there's so many different ways to do this basic pattern or at least what looks like a simple pattern visually. And um, the way I've done it here is actually different from the way I've done it in the book. The important thing is to just take into consideration um, the different ways that people uh, interacting with that interface will actually um, see it and understand it and use it. So the first thing I usually do um, uh, with this kind of stuff, you can see I've got the JavaScript here, which runs it, um, is I take a progressive enhancement approach. Now, broadly speaking, progressive enhancement doesn't actually address 
um, accessibility directly. It doesn't address um, accommodating disability, which I suppose is um, what accessibility is all about. Um, but it does mean that um, it takes care of other potential issues. So if I don't run the JavaScript, what's getting sent from the server here is just some structured content. So at the top, we have a main page heading. So that will be like an H1 or in fact, it, it should definitely be an H1 and there should only be one H1 on the page. And then there's a couple of uh, sections inside it and then you have the text revealed there by default. And so that's fine, I think. And the first thing you have to ask when you when you're embarking on making a component, especially something which includes some sort of interaction where you have to press buttons and things like that, is, is that needed at all in the first place? So although it may sound sort of slightly counterintuitive, a lot of the stuff that I've written about in the book, um, their solutions to, to things which your organization or, or, or whoever's responsible for the design and the interface have decided they definitely do need and, and that users will like. And that's a thing which you can only find out through research. Um, but the basic, um, the basic uh, interface is just content, which doesn't require anyone to press anything. And in many circumstances, it could be argued that that's a better interface than something where you have to, you have to press buttons to get to the content. It's certainly much simpler. So that's, first of all, worth worrying about. But the reason that it's done in a progressive enhanced way, so that the JavaScript runs in the client and enhances the markup, is that if I um, did the markup on the server um, in such a way that it already included the buttons and everything, but then JavaScript somehow didn't run on the client, then we'd get something like this. So it does these couple of functions which wrap stuff up and puts things in buttons and all of that. Um, which is the wrap content function here and then the buttonize heading function. Um, but then the actual interactive stuff, the stuff that has to happen on the client, the interface stuff, um, which is basically this toggle function, wouldn't run if JavaScript was turned off or JavaScript had failed or JavaScript had um, not managed to make it down the network or whatever reason. You can now see that the first collapsible, when I click on it, won't open so now the content isn't available to the user so that's already worse than if you hadn't created these uh these uh, collapsibles in the first place and it's not managed to make the second section in fact into a collapsible section because uh the content um uh because at that point it's running to an error where it's looking for the toggle function and it's not there so that's another thing to think about broadly in terms of inclusion. Okay, the way you go about and where you do the, the enhancement and whether you can actually even consider it an enhancement. Um, so there's that. Uh, the, you'll see this function here, the buttonize heading one. Basically what that does is it takes the content of the H2 and it puts that into a button and then puts the button inside the H2. The reason for that is that the button of semantic HTML has a lot of uh, behaviors and features which are already really useful. Um, and we wanna have the button semantics and the button features, but we also want to have the heading semantics and the heading features. Where a lot of people go wrong is they take the heading and they try and make the heading the button. They just put, either they just put click events on the heading or they, um, they, they will go so far as to put click events on the heading and put an ARIA role of say roll button on the heading. Now that would make it appear to be a, uh, a bona fide button in a screen reader, but it wouldn't be focusable, so it wouldn't be usable by keyboard. So there's all sorts of problems there. But also by putting roll button on the heading, you take away the heading semantics. And the heading semantics are really important because um, screen readers know that there are headings in the page. And for instance, on a window screen reader, if you were to press the two key, um, it allows you to traverse between headings. So you can kind of jump between sections in the page. Uh, roll equals button, then turns it into a button that's not available anymore. So what you wanna do is take the dynamically, take the button and insert the button into the heading. Then you have the heading semantics surrounding the button and the button behaviors the uh, it's focusable by keyboard and all of that good stuff. So that's another thing. Now I'm gonna have to go back to my Peter, list. 
Perfect. Yes. Just a second. If you wouldn't mind um, just increasing the font size a little. Oh, yeah. Good idea. Yeah, absolutely. So it would be a bit more legible. Thank you. Yeah. There we go. I hope much that's better. Much better. Everyone. Much better. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So there's there, there's the um, the little buttonize heading function I was uh, talking about there. Another consideration. So basically, I'm just the, the approach to this is just a. It, it, it's not like a box checking in terms of the web content accessibility guidelines or anything. It's just going through it and thinking where could this fail for someone, and then trying to anticipate that. So another thing um, is the iconography. So you can see the plus minus icons, and I think hopefully visually that's fairly clear that what that means is that um, plus means you can open it and minus means you can close it. Now, you'd have to do some research to determine whether or not that's um, preferable to having an arrow that points down and then, and then one that turns upside down and points upwards. That might be more familiar to people. And it's a lot of this is about familiarity. As I say, it's about conventions. Um, so there's that kind of thing to take into consideration. But the way you do the icon also is important. So in this case, I'm using an inline SVG and I've just I've just hand ridden this. So it's just a very simple path and then another path for the downstroke. And you see that has a class of down and that down class is um, tied here to the ARIA expanded uh, state. So ARIA, um, you can you can do a lot of good and a lot of bad with ARIA. The, the recent web aim survey found out that the the more kind of the more ARIA that you had on your site, the less accessible it was likely to be, uh, which is kind of ironic because the whole point of ARIA is it's supposed to enhance HTML to make it more semantic. So my advice is that if you are going to use ARIA, only use it for things that can't be done with HTML in the first place. So the chances are, if you're reaching for role equals button, you should be using a button because role equals button, as I said, doesn't guarantee, it doesn't guarantee that it's going to be accessible, except it's going to communicate it's a button to screen readers. It won't be focusable by keyboard, etc. cetera. Um, but here, there's no such thing in HTML as ARIA expanded, which is a state. So ARIA expanded, equals true, um, it would communicate uh, via the browser to the screen reader through the accessibility, underlying accessibility API, it would say um, toggle button. First of all, it kind of augments the role of the button and says that it's for toggling something. And then it would say expanded if you've set it in the attribute to true or collapsed false. So this is important information to a screen reader user. <clears throat> um, and it will help a a blind screen reader user because they would otherwise have no understanding that there was something that could be opened or closed because they can't see that. But also it helps um, sighted screen reader users because it gives a kind of hint as to how to use the interface. So people with say um, cognitive disabilities um, may um, find it more understandable if they're running a screen reader whilst um, interacting visually too. Um, I always actually uh, use the state itself. So I use an attribute selector in my CSS because then I know that what I'm looking at will, um, will be accessible because if the state works and I see the change, that means that that, that area expanded must be, must be toggling between one state and the other. If I was to use a class in parallel with the area expanded state, then there's every chance that the class could be working but I've forgotten to put ARIA expanded on there at all. So it's it's kind of, for my development process, it's kind of like a, a fail safe, if you like. So what do we have next? Let's have a look at my list. So we've got uh, state management iconography. So going back to the icon, with the icon, uh, the good thing about it being inline HTML is that it will, in it, you can force it to inherit the, uh, the color from the text surrounding it. So if I do um, uh, stroke equals current color, then, I mean, it's already doing this anyway, it would inherit the, the white color that I've got there, which is nice. Um, in fact, I'm doing something a little bit different here in that I'm using some custom properties. So you can see I've got a light, which at the moment is white and dark, which is black. And what that's allowing me to do is 
I can now uh, toggle between a kind of a light theme and a dark theme. So if I go down to the bottom here, I've got the prefers color scheme dark media query, and you can see light is now dark and dark is now light. So I can do a quick demo of how that would work if I open up my system preferences, general, go to my dark theme here. So this is a um, Mojave or however it's pronounced on, uh, on a MacBook. And now when I go back here, you can see that that honors that. And uh, I wouldn't be able to honor that for the icon so easily if it wasn't inline SVG, because I wouldn't be able to write CSS directly to change it. Um, if it was an external resource, I wouldn't be able to reach into it. So that's kind of handy. Um, some people actually have trouble with really high contrast. Now, sort of WCAG 101, making things accessible, and actually the most prevalent mistake that people make uh, in terms of accessibility is making things too low contrast. Um, everyone benefits from higher contrast. But if it's very, very high contrast, it can actually um, affect people. Um, it can be detrimental in some unexpected ways. So people with um, conditions like Erlen syndrome, when they see a very harsh white against a very dark black, um, they will actually struggle to, um, to be able to look at it. It's very uncomfortable because it creates optical illusions and sometimes even um, the illusion of movement because of that, that very harsh uh, uh, contrast. So what you can do then is you can temper those values. And if you're using custom properties, obviously that's easier. So I can do, uh, maybe it's gonna be um, EEE and 222 instead. You won't see that yet because I haven't changed it down here. So 222 and and that kind of tempers it. So it's still very high contrast. It's not going to fail um, the contrast um, criteria in the web content accessibility guidelines, but it's not quite as hard on the eyes, which is good. Okay, let's go back and see what else we've got. High contrast mode. So as I say, if you're, um, if you're using inline SVG and it respects the, um, the colors that you've set from the text and inherits those colors, then when you uh, are on the Windows operating system, you turn on high contrast mode, then it will adopt that as well. So it's kind of like my dark thing, but it's, a, it's an operating system uh, specific thing, but that, uh, that works as well. And then we've got keyboard accessibility, of course, it, as I say, using buttons, actually using buttons is good for keyboard accessibility um, because they're focusable by default. But also it's worth noting that, um, here we go, button here. Yeah, so the first line that I write is all inherit. And that's a nice way for me to reset the button, make sure that the button to begin with just looks like the heading and then I can add the box around it and make it um, uh, more accessible. Something for the high contrast theme here is the in the outline uh, statement here, I've actually got a transparent outline. Now you can't see that at the moment because obviously it's transparent. And what we have is a, the box shape tells me that it's like a button shape, right? But if I were to turn on the high contrast mode, um, high contrast mode in Windows combined with certain browsers, especially older browsers like Internet Explorer, um, will eliminate the background. And then I'll just get this text sort of floating in space. Um, this can be the case. Um, this can sort of ruin a lot of your buttons a lot of the time. So it can make your buttons look like text and then they don't have the affordance anymore. Now, affordance is a broadly a inclusive design concern. Again, doesn't really address accessibility and a disability direct or disability directly but with things without affordance they're difficult to understand they create more cognitive load you if you're trying to find buttons and try and determine what are buttons if it's not obvious then it's going to be something which is difficult to use so for high contrast mode <clears throat> we put the uh, transparent outline there when high contrast mode is switched on that transparent outline will become 
a solid outline. It will be augmented. It will be changed by the high contrast theme. And then you'll actually get a box around the shape. So it, it serves a similar purpose to having a background, which would then be missing. So that's something else to, uh, to consider as well. It's really just a laundry list of things to, to, to hopefully not fuck up is, uh, is what we're talking about. Obviously, the wording needs to be looked into. Again, if, if you're not working with your real copy, then you're missing an opportunity to actually find stuff which um, is uninclusive in, in the sense that people won't understand it or people find it offensive or that kind of thing. So working with Lauren Ipsum isn't a very good idea. I've only done it because I'm making a generic component here rather than a component for my specific design system within an organization that actually has a style guide and actually has copy, but it should be avoided generally. And then you have just making sure that it's responsive, of course, which is another, broadly speaking, an inclusive design concern. Um, you're probably aware of the fact that if you zoom uh, the page, it has the same effect as narrowing the viewport in that you will hit breakpoints. There aren't actually any breakpoints here because the interface is so simple. Uh, and generally, if you make interfaces simple, they are a easier to understand, but also you have much less to code against to make sure that it works for different devices. I would almost always choose an accordion above a tab interface, even though I actually wrote about tab interfaces in the book. There are warnings in the book of plenty of saying, well, tab interfaces are cool. If you're gonna do a tab interface, do it like this or close to like this, but probably you want to use an accordion. And one of the main reasons is that making a tab interface responsive without breakpoints, without changing the semantics and moving everything around is, uh, is pretty hard. So in this case of, if, I mean, if I did section one is the name of this section right here, uh, you can begin to see, hopefully, that um, the text just wrapped like this. So the, the, the equivalent thing and the tab interface is kind of comparable just because uh, it's another way of showing and hiding stuff. Most of web design, web interface design is just showing and hiding stuff, let's face it. Um, and you can see that the text just wraps like that. The tab interface, by putting the tabs next to each other to begin with, as soon as the tab uh, gets too long, then you're kind of in trouble. So it's not as robust generally just because of that. Generally simpler things are more robust. And the, the key thing here is that even though this is a very simple interface and there's a lot of things to consider um, when you're trying to make it as inclusive as you can, um, there are much more complex interfaces and the implementation for them is therefore um, tenfold more complex than that. So it's, so important to try to focus on keeping things as simple as possible. Uh, if something is simple, then it takes less code, which is better for, for, for performance. There's less to interact with, so there's less to misunderstand in terms of operating the interface. Um, it's basically um, the best approach is just to keep things as simple as you can. Anyway, that's kind of, I just wanted you to sort of think about uh, to get into my head and uh, how I sort of look at things and and try and find problems, different kinds of problems in terms of accessibility and inclusion as I'm making these little bits of interface or these components. And the idea of the book, it's just an anthology of, of what I was thinking when I was doing it. And all I'm really doing is drawing on quite a lot of experience that I've had. But, you know, you're going to go away, hopefully, after reading the book and you'll come up with stuff which is... Uh, which is even better. So, uh, so all of those different concerns are organized around the component because that's how I work. That's how we work, I think, generally as developers and as designers, as we take, um, we, we're trying to build a thing. Um, but then what's sort of contradictory is that the uh, web content accessibility guidelines, um, which uh, have criteria grouped into perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust, um, they're kind of abstract because they it's it's organised in terms of the criteria rather than the component. Obviously, WCAG can't um, 
can't tell you what components you're going to make. And that's just something that I found is really helpful when I've been um, consulting companies on on their uh, on their design systems and making them accessibility, uh, making them accessible is to try as much as possible to organize it around components because it feels like you're actually making something then um, doing a load of uh, me creating a load of tickets um, for an organization and just about let's say um, image alternative text saying so okay this component on this part of your website that needs alternative text and this one over here and this one over here and this one over here and all of these different places it's a very boring thing to then go and try and fix but also at the end of it you, you haven't got yourself this this um, bulletproof component at the end of it you've only just sort of ticked off little bits of fragmented inaccessibility uh so yeah uh so when i was writing inclusive design patterns the predecessor to this book i tried to actually write about it in those terms i tried to write about keyboard accessibility for one chapter and then screen reader accessibility for another chapter and then language um in another chapter and i got kind of writer's block because that's simply not how i work and then i got to thinking well i make interfaces accessible i don't make ex uh sorry i i don't uh, make interfaces accessible i make accessible interfaces because i'm a designer and that's how i want other people to work because otherwise it gets to the point where you're an accessibility consultant and people are coming to you and going well, I've, I've made this thing, we need to make it accessible though, because otherwise we're in trouble. And, but then it's too late. And, and now this is actually quite a popular and well-known um, thing now that you have, to, you have to have accessibility as part of the design process from an early stage. Um, but it, was, it felt like it was important to do um, some literature about this. And with inclusive components, the idea is that it was a pattern library as a blog. So every time I wrote a blog post, I was, it was like I was creating a component, but for a sort of generic pattern library that everyone that could then uh, take part in and, and, and read and go, oh, okay, well, I'm gonna make my own version of this component like, uh, like it's done in inclusive components. Um, and so I go through things like content sliders and collapsible sections. So the collapsible sections, which obviously I was just talking about, in this case, um, I, uh, I actually do them as web components and that kind of works in a similar way. It's progressive enhancement still because a web component or rather a custom element uh, is treated as a div unless the JavaScript runs. So it's exactly the same kind of thing. It just has uh, custom element and web component technology doing it. Um, tab interfaces are covered with all of the caveats, uh, kind of things like theme switches, and which is largely just, uh, just um, what do you call them, uh, CSS filters. So you can just literally invert uh, the colors on a page as a really kind of uh, quick and efficient way of uh, creating a dark or, or inverted theme and so on and so on. So it's, kind of like inclusive design patterns, but it gets into more detail and there's more um, there's more variety in the ways I do things. So some of them are in React, some of them are, one of them is in Vue, uh, the, uh, the uh, to-do list is in Vue, uh, but most of it's in vanilla JavaScript. Um, and there are live code examples um, for those things. But the overall main thing is just, is not, I'm, try, I'm not trying to say, I've done it like this, therefore you should do it like this. I'm saying I've thought about it this way and I think it would be beneficial to your users and to your organization that you think about it in this way. You will come up with different conclusions as to how to do things and how to implement things, but you'll be looking for answers to the right question, which is how do I make this as friendly and as usable to as many people as possible. Uh, so eventually, uh, I, the, the book, uh, rather the blog became a book um, and I spent a, a long time messing around with EPUB and stuff like that. Um, but then a few people were saying this should be a print book. I'd, I'd rather read it as print, which is sort of a, another interesting inclusive design sort of philosophical point is that um, while an electronic book is probably technically more uh, has more appeal 
or, or is or is able to be used by more people because it can be read visually but also screen readers are compatible with it and that kind of thing some people just by preference prefer something in print it's more ergonomic or it's more comfortable for them to read things that way so um so i i was on board as soon as smashing magazine uh, said they would support the idea to have a, a print version of the book too and it was an opportunity to also update a lot of things and get things um uh, using more contemporary apis and that kind of stuff uh, and this has sort of bloomed into, I don't know, a bit of a sort of a career in a way. I've been working with organisations like um, Bulb, the energy company in the UK and the BBC. And we've created stuff together in a similar way. And it's just I've been basically I write documentation. I, I just go through, try and make something as, as well as I can with accessibility in mind. And then I write about it and then it's and then it's published. Uh, so, for instance, here's the, the BBC components I've been working on. You can see there's some familiar ones in there, like carousels, which is kind of like content sliders uh, and tabs down there towards the bottom. But there's also BBC specific stuff. So when you've exhausted uh, reading inclusive components and other stuff like that, and then maybe go over to uh, the BBC design system. I haven't put the URL in, actually, which I should have done. Uh, it's, it's on GitHub, bbc.github.io slash gel, G-E-L. So you can uh, you can go and find some stuff there. Um, that's an evolving resource because obviously we're drawing on more research as we go along. Tabs were really interface, uh, really in, uh, interesting because we discovered a lot of things in research which um, which contradicted our assumptions, I suppose, which is always fun. Um, and that fed back into the book, in fact. So um, that was some of the updated material in the book. So, yeah, that's all been fun. Uh, here's a, this is your content slider thing there. You've got a native scroll bar and you've got some intersection observer, which fades out the uh, items which are going off screen. It doesn't just fade them out. It actually makes them invisible to screen readers so that they have a a comparable experience they're, they're only um, interacting with what's visible there all those sorts of things um, so whilst i'm organizing things by component and i think it's better to work that way where you're just trying to fix all of the accessibility uh, potential issues around the component that you're building obviously all of this is informed by principles and i think it's probably worth me mentioning uh, the inclusive design principles which i co-wrote with uh, some of my, well, heroes really, but also, also um, at the time, uh, colleagues, uh, Henny Swan, Ian Pouncey and Lainey Watson. Lainey did a really good, uh, really popular screencast with Smashy Magazine about how screen readers um, uh, use um, websites and uh, as a screen, uh, a habituated screen reader user, herself obviously you get a lot of insight there so i i would uh, go and check that out but um it's basically brace so if you're wondering what the difference is between inclusive design and accessibility then it's maybe compare the web content accessibility guidelines to to these principles which we've came up with basically they're a lot broader they don't they don't address functional uh things which might affect disability directly necessarily it is about um preference as well as also need and you know things like can um, be consistent uh so you want to make sure that things are as expected uh in terms within your own interface but also as we were discussing earlier um in terms of um how it relates to or how it how it um draws from a culture and a history of how we do things on the web you know um, don't put your navigation for your website at the bottom of the page when everyone else is putting it at the top because that's only going to um, it's only going to go against people's expectations that kind of stuff and as I say <clears throat> that makes things broadly more usable hopefully uh, as well as helping people in extreme situations such as people with temporary or permanent disabilities and then uh, my friend Adam asked me to edit this book, Form Design Patterns, and it sort of follows a similar formula um, in that it um, looks at 
individual patterns of uh, implementations of different types of form. I highly recommend this book um, for obvious reasons, um, but also, I mean, forms are so difficult and this is some very sort of straightforward advice about it. So I'm gonna uh, tie things up and then I'll hand back to Vitaly in just a second. Uh, so first of all, there's no right or wrong in these things. So I'm not always right. And I don't want you to buy this book or read anything that I write and think he's, he, you know, he's trying to tell me how I should do it 100%. I'm saying this is how I did it for these reasons. And this is what I cared about whilst I was doing it. That's the thing. Um, accessibility is not a binary thing. You don't, it's not either accessible or not accessible, it's either more accessible or less accessible. And the, the idea is that you tr just try to make things more accessible and more inclusive in general. Um, and trust your instincts as much as possible. Um, there was a thing that came up recently, which really angered me. Uh, and what it was, was that Google, their material design system thing, um, for a long time they had uh, text inputs, which they included in it. And these text inputs had, they were kind of weird looking in that they had, they were just had a line rather than it being shaped like a box. And not only that, they, um, they had the floaty label thing where the label kind of looks like a placeholder. And then it's only when you focus on the input that the, the placeholder floats up and goes into the sort of label position. Totally over-engineered thing, but because it's material design, because they're Google, lots of people adopted this. So I see these kinds of text inputs all over the place, but, but so many people don't understand them and they don't understand them simply because they don't look like text inputs. So simultaneous to all of this going on, I'm going from organization to organization, seeing that they're using these kinds of weird looking kind of unintuitive inputs and saying, turn them into boxes, put the label at the top, don't make the label move around just keep it like that. But then the thing that was annoying was that this article came out a couple of days ago and it was some UX people at Google saying, we've done some research and we've discovered that people actually um, don't know to or don't like to interact with the inputs as they were designed. So we've redesigned them to look like boxes and have the label in the right place and everything. And in fact, they actually use the phrase, um, some users thought, um, discovered that, we discovered that some users had where they saw just the line underneath where the text should be. They thought it was a divider between two different parts of the form rather than actually being a field in the form, which is more or less the exact words I was using. And here's the thing, I didn't commission 600 people to do that research. This is another thing about inclusive design because you've got to kind of, uh, what's the expression, use Occam's razor or whatever it is. You need to, you can't research everything. You can't test all of your assumptions all the time so you have to rely on common sense and just using your instincts if it looks like an input and it's just kind of standard then the chances are that most of the people who are going to see it and interact with it are going to get it whereas if you alternatively take the approach of just completely wildly and without any kind of um real logical premise totally reinvent something just because it seems like fun and then propagate it around the whole web and then come back to it later and go, actually, no, we were wrong. People have no idea what we were attempting here. I mean, that's obviously the wrong way around, isn't it? Um, so on that note, I'm going to stop talking about all of this stuff. Vitaly. Yes, sir. Um, first of all, <laughs> can you hear me? Yeah, I think. You yes. Can. Yeah. First of all, on my side, um, I have to say that I'm, I'm very grateful um, because to be honest, I've been struggling with accessibility for many years, kind of really trying to understand how to get into this mindset, how to get things done in a way that they would be most inclusive, most accessible. And uh, your book helped me already a lot. I mean, just by you know reading it because we had to, you know, when publishing it, uh, it was actually very useful for me to kind of get, uh, get an understanding of how you would get into somebody else's shoes, right? Because as designers, we do have empathy. This is kind of the part of what we do anyway. And as developers, actually, as well. But I find it's actually quite difficult, remarkably difficult, to foresee this huge 
um, number of options and settings and contexts and circumstances that people can be in. So yeah. for somebody who is kind of maybe having an initial like me, really kind of understanding of that piece of code, what implications might it have for people with certain disabilities or for people in certain yeah. contexts? What would be the first step to get there to the point where you actually understand um, or maybe recognize some of those warning signs that your code might not be perfect in perfect shape? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, first of all, I, I, I don't think anyone's code is ever in perfect shape. I don't think I've ever written any perfect code. And I'm not sure uh, I know anyone who has. But um, yeah, uh, obviously n- none of us are mind readers. So to some extent, we do have to just speak to people as much as possible. And it, not necessarily just commissioning research um, in the sort of formalized organizational way. Um, but also uh, just talking to people, you make something, you, you, you're you worried that it that people might not get it. Maybe post something on Twitter and say, hey, could you share this around and ask people this question and see if, they, um, if there's any problems that they'd be aware of either for themselves or from people that they know have, have, have struggled with stuff. Ultimately, you can only just accumulate uh, experience there's no sort of way of, of kind of um, uh, there's no sort of formula for just sort of magically getting it. Uh, you just hear more stuff as you go along. And so my whole career, if you like, of doing accessibility is just there'll be fewer instances now where I would make a mistake, but it's only because I've made that mistake before and someone has said, this doesn't work for me. You know, right, so right. With, the, with the purpose of the book is just to sort of, it's all of that accumulated stuff, which I wanted to share, I guess. Yeah, I think um, this is something that could be really useful for many people. And I'm really happy that this is actually available for everybody uh, online as well. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, the common questions that come up in, in every discussion about accessibility uh, is the notion of how to sell it or how to convince someone oh, yeah. it's important, right? Um, maybe just before we continue, if you could turn off the screen sharing, because otherwise it takes up quite a bit of space. Well, if I can find the button, I will do just that. I uh, think if you stop sharing, there is a screen button share and you need to stop sharing, I guess. Um, no? Yeah. I'm, see, this isn't an interface which I find very easy to use, funny enough. I've got a chat window. And no, I've got a mute button. Okay, well, I don't want to mute you. Okay, <laughs> okay so maybe uh, that's okay. I hope it doesn't bother most people. I hope it's okay. Um, yeah, then, sorry. yeah, that's fine. So uh, maybe let's just dive into some questions. And we have two questions from the audience already. Uh, and that's actually also something that I was diving, trying to dive into as well. So Carlos uh, is yeah. asking. So how do we educate people that accessibility is not just a legal requirement, but the right thing to do? And maybe building on top of that, uh, how do you make a case? I mean, I'm struggling all the time working with, you know, different companies and um, mm-hmm. agencies. Um, they kind of understand the value of accessibility, they understand why it's important to do so. But at the same time, they are running behind schedule. They are totally out of time. The projects are on fire and everybody's just writing out, like writing away this beautiful React code. And then mm-hmm. eventually comes the magical time when a very expensive accessibility consultant has to be hired to bring in accessibility, right? Because of yes. legal requirements. So how would you deal with you know, this situation, this work? What would be your advice? That's a good, uh, good question. Um, I think uh, there is a point of no return where the, the, the bad practices which are used by an organization are just going to, um, going to be insurmountable. Uh, you can hire as many experts as you like. It's simply the process hasn't been there from the beginning. So therefore, it is not, it's, it's really not going to be easy to, uh, to fix in any way. Um, and I personally have, have, have done work for as a, as a, as a consultant with, with some organizations like that. And I find it's, um, it's very demoralizing. It's very, mm. I mean, people talk about um, burnout 
and they talk about burnout like it's where you get really tired like physically tired or you're overworked but actually I think burnout is more where you're demoralized by where you've you've lost control over something or you you're really passionate about something but there's just no way to actually um to actually get it done and to actually work well with with certain people and so I actually made a move to to advertise that I I was only interested in giving my services as a as a technical expert to people who were genuinely interested in making things accessible that they actually cared about it and they wanted to accommodate it they weren't just doing it just so they weren't going to be sued or whatever and I think that's I mean it's it's it's, perhaps it's only answering the question in a sort of lateral way but uh, I think that there are some organizations which are just toxic and, and a good sign that they're toxic is that they are very resistant to um, to putting real effort in and real concern into making things accessible and usable broadly speaking um, and I actually want those organizations simply to fail and be replaced by better organizations, uh, which is kind of, I mean, perhaps that's, for some people that's maybe kind of a political stance almost, um, but, but that's how I feel about things. It's, I, I'm, I, I'm tired of, of trying to drag people up reluctantly, you know? Um, so do good where you can with people who are willing. Uh, I mm -hmm. think so. So it's a quite, I mean, not everyone has the choice to move out of an organization um, that, that doesn't have that culture because, you know, you need to pay the bills, et cetera. But as much as you can um, try to find people to work with who actually care, because it's, it's not something that can be fixed, but there are a lot of companies which simply don't care and should probably avoid those companies as a customer as well as uh, an employee. <laughs> mm. I think uh, one of the interesting things you see people doing, it's pretty much with everything that you want to convince your manager of, be it performance or privacy, security, it doesn't matter. Um, it's like, you know, whenever you plant a seed somewhere, whenever mm. you start kind of planting a little bit of flexibility here and then you kind of gather your army around you of people who really care. Because yeah. most of the time, if I look around, it's not like we, we don't, we don't build in accessibility because we have bad intentions or no. because we were malicious or anything. It's just, we're usually busy. Maybe we don't know enough about accessibility sometimes. So we feel like, okay, if I add this area role, it's probably not going to do what it's supposed to do. And so, mm -hmm. you know, we kind of need to educate people around as well. Um, and luckily there are really great resources kind of coming up these days where you just look into a particular component and you, think about how would it, what it, what it has been for my project and you plug it in. Yes. I think it's all like probably small steps, right? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the kind of organization you're describing would be one where I'd consider that the culture was good enough that they're simply lacking in the knowledge, not, not in the, not in the willing. Yes. And so, uh, so for instance, bold were very much like that. They, they, they felt, and they were kind of, it was cute because they were sort of, a bit ashamed at the same time that they they were lacking in knowledge in terms of accessibility they they're a very self-consciously ethical company in lots of ways they deal in green energy but they simply just didn't have the expertise so mm. they were you know they were a good organization to work with because i knew that they would be they would be amenable to actually doing their best and listening to what i had to say yeah, um, and awesome. not just because their lawyer was telling them or, or what have you yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one interesting thing is because you've been working with us on the smashing site as well and we've been having conversations and you actually yeah. ruined the myth for me because for a very long time I used to believe that uh, screen readers don't understand JavaScript well oh, okay, yeah. I just remember now how much JavaScript you wrote for accessibility um, <laughs> and yeah. that was uh, really, really impressive actually so um, how would you recommend people to, to deal in situations where you have a really monolithic or really huge React application, Angular application. Are there mm. any particular accessibility things that show up quite a lot in uh, single page applications? Uh, okay, so the first thing is there's this weird perception that people have with, with React and with Angular and with any kind of JavaScript framework is that first of all, as you were saying, because it's JavaScript based, or rather like JavaScript is sort of JavaScript first in that the JavaScript 
kind of uh, creates the DOM if it's client side rendered and all of that stuff. So people think those things and they think JavaScript and then therefore they think can't be accessible because JavaScript, which as you say, not true. And um, screen readers for a long time have have understood changes to the page. So, I mean, all they have to understand is that there's changes in the in the DOM, if you like, um, and which is a what you're doing most of the time when you're using JavaScript in interfaces, I suppose. So you're changing a state here, like in the the uh, collapsible example I did earlier. Mm -hmm. You're you're changing error expanded from false to true. And most screen readers, they will if you're on that button when you press it and when it does that, it will immediately announce the change in state. So if it's going to collapse, it will say button collapse. So it's like, oh, it's collapsed now. So this is what you did. So you get feedback. And this is because screen readers kind of, um, they recache um, the DOM as your as it's being manipulated by JavaScript. And really it's just dealing in HTML, but it has, its, uh, um, it has this cache, which is refreshed. Um, but there's other things as well, like uh, moving focus around, uh, or sometimes called focus management. Marcy Sutton does a lot of, uh, writes a lot about um, React accessibility. And a lot of that is about making sure that focus is, uh, keyboard focus is, is moved to the right place at the right time. Um, classic one is when you open a dialogue, the focus should be moved into the dialogue so that you can interact with it. And also so that the dialogue contents are announced. And then when you close the dialogue, the focus needs to be moved back. And you need to use JavaScript to do that. And if you're moving focus with JavaScript, uh, then the screen reader will know that the focus has changed. It will announce the newly focused item. So that's all, that all works. But there's the specific things to do with single page application. So in an accessibility sense, um, if, you're, if you've got a number of different views which sort of imitate pages, then there's the question of how, to what extent you try and make those views behave like whole page refreshes. So when a new view is loaded, you're moving into that page. Um, what do you announce? What do you focus? Because if you don't do that, if you don't handle it uh, kind of deliberately, then the new view will appear visually, but a screen reader user wouldn't hear anything change. And they yep. just think, well, mm -hmm. nothing's happened. I must be in the same place, which could be obviously very confusing. So that's kind of a specific single page application thing to worry about. But in this kind of broader inclusive design sense, I mean, something which uses a lot of client side rendering is going to be very intensive, especially on the CPU of, a, of low power devices. So again, not addressing disability directly, um, but if you're on a low power device on a poor network and the, uh, the website or the web application you're trying to view um, needs to pass loads and loads of JavaScript. It might fail halfway through doing that. It might not be able to actually acquire all of that and render it. And then you have weird things like um, time to interaction problems. So someone in that situation, they're trying to access the page. The page renders because say the HTML and the CSS is cleverly server-side rendered, but then it has to pass a whole, say React or Angular library in order to make it interactive in the intervening time, and that can be anything up to seven or eight seconds or more. Right, and they're it turns up with rage buttons. clicks, right? Yeah, and so uh, they're trying to interact with it and nothing happens. So that could happen to anyone in that situation. Um, and it happens to me quite often when I'm, you know, I'm on the train and I'm trying to interact with stuff on my phone and look at things. Uh, so there's, there's those kinds of performance concerns as well. I try as much as possible, and in the book, I. I try to make things very minimally with just um, with just um, vanilla JavaScripts because I believe in just doing what's needed with as little as possible. I, I don't want to kind of client side render a whole blog or whatever just just mm. because I want a couple of little things to be interactive. Right. It's yeah. interesting that you're saying that because actually um, I feel like this year we are reaching this point where we start thinking about uh, the notion of network aware components or memory aware components mm. as well. Um, also Google has come up with a couple of techniques for predictive fetching and things like that, but also um, thinking about how we can use network information API and also device memory API mm. to provide different experience to different kind of users 
so very often we just serve the same monolithic bundle, like we bundle all the JavaScript and serve it. Um, yeah. Although, you know, we are probably smarter now with Webpack chunks and all. But uh, I feel like, or maybe just me, but I feel like we are getting to the point where we'll be thinking as designers on the one side, okay, we have this experience, but maybe that experience has to be tailored for 3G, 2G, 4G. Yeah. And, you know, fast whatever connection. Yeah. That also means that maybe for each of those individual states, 3G, 2G, 4G, and so on and so forth, we have to think about the amount of JavaScript and the performance budget for that particular case. Mm. So that means that by default on a slow 3G, for example, with just no parallax, no web fonts, yes. no video replay and all. And the same goes for device memory. If you have something like uh, memory intensive, whatever going on, um, you might want to, again, isolate it and maybe run it later or maybe run it on demand. Mm. Um, but some people, when I, when I brought this idea, and when we started talking about it, they said, well, as if we didn't have enough complexity in the world, <laughs> right? Um, but I'm wondering, do you think that this is the way where we're going, where we have to go? Because in the end, there is a huge gap between low-end devices and um, you know, high-end devices. Yeah. Of course, oh, you could say... Uh, so, sorry, sorry, I just wanted to to, um, yeah. to bring it up to the point. Um, and of course, you could say, you know, we care only about high-end devices because this is where our customers are and all. But then, you know, you if you totally eliminate the market of mid-end devices or like low-end devices, mm. you're just losing tons of customers. This is going to be the majority of customers. Yeah, well, m- more people are doing things on on uh, mobile devices with your comparatively lower CPU yeah, exactly. these days anyway, um, especially in, uh, I mean, in markets like China, that's really the case, like an extreme case of that. Um, I, I hope it moves in that direction. I hope that we become more uh, sensible about how we provision uh, JavaScript. I mean, it, ultimately, JavaScript is the problem in terms of performance. I mean, there's there's no CSS selector that is going to be that is going to ruin the performance of an experience. But there's plenty of JavaScript uh, that can. And I think, um, yeah, I think we need to focus there as much as possible. And we need to. I mean, we yeah. Generally, we need to appreciate that. Uh, people have different experiences in in a multitude of different ways now we can't we can't take into consideration each of those different individual cases because we're not capable of that we can't do that so what we have to kind of do uh, and this is kind of like an inclusive design mantra in a way is that you have to um try not to exclude people rather than trying to include everyone and every mm-hmm. different individual um and their specific preferences. I mean, my various preferences for the way I browse things are going to be unique, in fact. They're not going to be like everyone else, uh, anyone else in the well, world. Well, you don't know that. <laughs> well, my, my doppelganger might, might do things in exactly the same way, yeah. But, um, but uh, you can't afford to approach things like that, like, uh, oh, this person said they like the interface like this, right? We need to make it like that for them. But also, this person wanted it like this, and this person wanted it like this, and then there's this other person who lives in the Himalayas and there's this problem with network connectivity. You just have to try and make things as simple and robust. And uh, I use the term multimodal, which is sort of a a, a bit of an over technical term, I suppose, but make things so that they're flexible so that people can use them in different ways with Mm. different inputs and different outputs. And It's not actually that hard if you do that. As long as you pare things down, you can make things which most people will get on with pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, let's move on to some questions from the audience. And dear friends, if you have some questions uh, about anything, really, just bring them up and we'll spend the next maybe 10, 15 minutes. How much time do you have, Hayden? Yeah, I can do 10 or 15 yeah. minutes. Yeah, no. 15 minutes to answer them. Uh, and I'm looking at YouTube and Zoom as well. Um, so let's see, let's see. First of all, uh, Claire is wondering if you would share the link to the pen that you were highlighting. Oh yeah. Um, is there somewhere I can share that in Zoom? Yeah. If you type it in chat. Oh, okay. Uh, let me just find the, grab the link first. Mm. All right. There you go. There you go, Claire, and everyone else who wants to have a look. 
Thank you. Um, also, Pawan is wondering about that collapsible example. Um, for that mm. example, instead of making it a button in code, what if the structure was h3, href, heading, and code the desired behavior in JavaScript? Would that work? If you look in the Q&A box, you will see that question as well hidden. Q&A box, right. I've got to find that. <laughs> oh, uh, do you see it? No. Oh, wait, is that in YouTube? No, it's on Zoom, actually. No, you, don't, you can't see it. Well, it's, uh, I'm, see, the thing is, I'm actually terrible at using interfaces, virtually. So. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> that's why but, I asked. But the question is, the question is, in, instead of making it uh, a button mm. um, in code, what if the structure was h3 and then the href, a href, um, and yeah. code the desired behavior, desired behavior in JavaScript? Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so uh, now, if I had a link which was just above the thing that it was linking to, then um, that would be kind of weird because I wouldn't be really going anywhere except to the next element in source order. So a button to toggle the state backwards and forwards feels, feels better in terms of the source order for an accordion. Um, whereas if I was making a tab interface, I might progressively enhance that from a table of contents. So I'd have the table of contents at the top and you have all the links together, right? So you have like a list of links, which then would become the tabs if you were to enhance it in inverted commas in that way. Um, so then the links would kind of work, I think. So you would you would have table of contents and then the name of what would be the tabs and you'd click on those links and they would take you just because they're same page links to the ID of the, the section with the H3, right? So I think if it was that source order, all the links first and then the sections, then it makes sense to have the links which take you back and down the page. Whereas if the content is immediately after the control button or link, then I think a button makes more sense. I hope that answers the question, if I've understood the question correctly. Yeah, sorry if I didn't uh, bring it up. So I think, oh yeah, so I'm going to Pan, I think we send it to panelists only. Now, Clary should be able to see that one as well. Um, I love oh, there's a sectioning elements question. Can I just quickly yes. cover yeah, sure. that? From, it's the, the name is truncated, so it looks like it's an ale. All oh, right, okay. I love pixel. Yeah, okay. So, um, so when, it, when HTML5 came out, we had sectioning elements. So we had section, in fact, I wrote an article about it. I don't know if you remember it a long time ago for Smashy Magazine. We had sectioning elements. So we had section, we had article, et cetera, et cetera. And the idea was that if you used H1s per section and you nested those sections, then browsers would automatically, um, based on the nesting level of the sectioning element, work out how it should be communicated to a screen reader. So if it was a section with an H1 nested within the body of the page, it would automatically interpret it as an H2. If it was a section nested within that section with an H1, then that H1 would be interpreted as an H3. Really good idea and actually um, something that was talked about by Tim Berners-Lee when HTML was first designed. They never went with that. Uh, that concept, so, which was like where we'd have just H tags and it would be automatically or algorithmically computed. But they were, they did discuss that. Um, unfortunately, no browser still to this day, and we've, how long have we had HTML5? It's been 10 years. Something Seven. like that. Yeah, sounds about right. It's been a long, long time. Yeah, it's been a long time. Um, no one still has um, none of the vendors have implemented the document outline algorithm. So browsers are still ill-equipped to communicate that nesting um, to screen readers and therefore screen readers will just see lots of H1s, which means screen readers will just see a flat hierarchy of headings, which is not useful. You Obviously a screen reader user would like to um, know some depth to the structure in the page. So unfortunately, even where you're using sectioning elements, you should still use numbered headings. Um, mm -hmm. But there's a way, if you're using React uh, or a framework like that, there are ways of automating it so that you kind of 
you can uh, use the context API, for instance, to automatically um, uh, use React itself to actually work out what the nesting level should be. Um, and I wrote an article about that. It's on Medium called Heading Levels in Design Systems or something like that. If you, if you search for that, you'll find an article where I go into that. And it was actually uh, Sophie Alpert who, who stepped in and suggested the context API idea. So you can sort of use your own code to automate it. But um, browsers do not do it for you, so you can't simply use H1s in a in a generic web page, unfortunately. Okay, all right. Um, Petty has a note. It's not a question, but a bit of advice that earlier for the earlier topic um, mm. on what they've done in the organization. Um, what we've done in our organization is deliberately seek out the people who do care about these things and try to get together to make a lot of noise about accessibility. Right. So this is like exactly good. my experience as well, and good we've had. We've had to do a lot of small individual improvements and fight some carefully chosen battles, but we're slowly normalizing the concept of accessibility within the design, content, and, and engineering teams. And then finally, there is still not quite enough importance placed on it by everyone, but our little team of internal experts has given people an obvious place to go for help and input, even when they don't know or care much about it themselves. Yeah, that's 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 great. What's the name of that's great. That, his, who wrote that comment? Uh, it's Petty, Petty Duke. Okay, but, well, uh, the organization wasn't named. Okay, Petty, well, Petty's doing um, great work there. Yeah, uh, that sounds really, really good. And thank it's, you so much for sharing as well. Yeah, yeah, that uh, that sounds um, sounds like you're doing some great stuff there. Well done. I know how hard it is. I mean, I I work as a consultant, and work uh, sort of independently a lot of the time. I know how hard it is and how frustrating it can be to from inside an organization where you have your sort of role and there's the politics of the organization and all of that stuff to just get that stuff through. And so um, keep up the good fight and it sounds like you're doing a good job. Yeah, thank you so much, Peter, for sharing as well. <laughs> um, actually, question from Carlos, which is similar, maybe one of the last ones actually. Uh, yeah. It's also, actually also similar to the one that I had too, uh, namely, so what are we going to do with all these new shiny things that are coming up this day? This is uh, we have Google Voice devices and Carlos is wondering, now we have browsers everywhere from watches to fridges. So how do you manage accessibility across all of these weird and different devices? Oh, I see what you mean. I mean, I mean, I, my first and last love is the web. So I, uh, some people ask me about, uh, frequently ask me and, about the accessibility of different sort of Internet of Things stuff and um, and native applications and that kind of thing. And unless it's in Electron, which is basically just a Chrome browser in a sandbox, then uh, I don't know much about it. All of my focus is on is on web stuff. But they're all interesting areas. There's lots of um, great stuff happening in games, in gaming industry as well to do with accessibility. They're leading in a lot of in a lot of ways and we could learn a lot from them. Um, one thing I will say about some of this stuff that comes out is, uh, and actually Laura Kalbag is, is someone who, who talks about this a lot. And I think it's something which needs to be talked about is that not everything, uh, not everything should be accessible. Um, everything that exists should be accessible, but not everything should exist. And, when some device or some some uh, Internet of Things thing come, comes out and it has huge ethical concerns relating to privacy or whatever, then it shouldn't it shouldn't have been made anyway. It should, that's that's the problem with it, and that kind of damns it. Um, so, uh, I guess what I'm saying is that you should always think about ethics in a broader way it's sort of intersectional when you're thinking about accessibility uh, so always look out for that kind of thing so some newfangled thing comes out and and there are broad accessibility concerns it doesn't save it that it's um sorry if there are broader ethical concerns it doesn't save it if it's the basis that it might be accessible yeah exactly 
Yeah, so um, it's been very interesting to see, again, the rise of GDPR, privacy, uh, mm. legal issues, and CCPA coming up in, in uh, California in, in um, January 1st, in a couple of months now. Yeah. So I'm really looking forward to see how the web is going to change. And I hope my, I'm hope i hopeful that it's going to change for the better. But it mm. feels like there is a lot of movement happening now these days. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Bess has also one note, namely, there was an... Mm. ERG group for disability at my last company. It helped to do a company wide lunch and learn to get people curious and invested company wide. That's oh, point that's cool. Because you know, for for a very long time, uh, I I thought that uh, not, not I thought of, for a very long time I was um, just not certain or not sure about how am I going to kind of proceed with um, with my work in front end in regards to accessibility and in regards to inclusive design, right? Um, and one example for that was really interesting because I was interviewing um, a girl who was deaf uh, in, I don't remember what conference that was. And I freaked out when I, when I, when I, when I, was, when I realized that I'm supposed to interview her. I just didn't know what to do, how to behave and all those you things. Want to, you want to do up. the best you can, don't you? You yeah. don't want to let them down. And then Absolutely. that's really, yeah, it makes you nervous. Yeah, and so I think that for many of us, it's just really being exposed to all kinds of different people, diverse groups of people from different yeah. backgrounds, different cultures, different capabilities and all. This is how you really get better, both as a designer and developer and as a human being. So for me, this was a yeah. remarkable experience. And I learned so much. For example, I had no idea that sign language, like a universal sign language doesn't exist. Like, for example, oh, yeah, Netherlands. Oh, yeah, different kinds of sign language. Yeah, and yeah. Netherlands and England and yeah. Germany, they would all have their own different sign languages. Yeah, and British they would sign need language, have, American sign language. Yeah. yeah, and then we need to have, like, local translators for that. And, you know, once you expose, like, in your case, Bess, um, I think this is where you kind of get... On one side, the sense of empathy, and on the other side, the sense of understanding of what it means to design for uh, this particular individual. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, this is just sort of like a general truth, I think, is that the, the less people are exposed to things, the more they fear them. Um, and that can be, you know, that can manifest in, in innocent ways. But also, like, um, when you see, uh, there was someone who, who published um, a map of Britain, which showed it compared the level of immigration to how many people voted for Brexit. And so all of the people who were voting for Brexit um, for fear of immigration were the places where there was the least immigration. This immigration, yeah. It was just, they weren't exposed to it. They didn't know what it was. And so they were afraid of it. And so yeah. they, yeah. yeah. Whereas I other knew, people, they I, got used to a multicultural society and really quite enjoyed it. And then they were happy to yeah, I, I knew that this discussion will end up with <laughs> Brexit. I knew it. Eventually. Right. Yeah. So maybe the final question for you, Hayden. Yeah. You have to be perfectly honest with me. Can I be perfectly honest? I'm always you? perfectly honest with you. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so what's the next big thing for you? What are you looking forward to do next? The oh, okay. Thing is, so what's next? Um, Cooking? The, <laughs> the thing I'm working on at the moment is actually... I'm getting more and more into the web audio API. Mm -hmm. So I think I mentioned it at the start of this talk, but I'm, I'm working on a, a drum machine and I'm, I'm making this drum machine as accessible as it possibly can be. It's using web technology because it's an electron app that I'm working on. There is actually, it's called Beads and there is actually a, a PWA version of it um, floating about if you look up Beads drum machine. But I'm trying to, I'm, making it into it hopefully into a fully fledged app so i'm learning a lot about electron and stuff like that but um but it's really interesting working in a sandboxed uh chromium because you can just use all of the stuff which is supported by chromium you don't actually have to worry about other browsers so for instance um i can turn on a flag in my electron setup which um supports which makes it support um focus visible you know focus visible the pseudo class Italy? Yeah, sorry. I, I just, <laughs> You're right. Yeah, <laughs> the, I, just, I just got another question coming in. Sorry. Oh, okay, no worries. Yeah. So fo Focus Visible is supported by Chromium behind a flag, and if mm -hmm. you're making an Electron app, you can just turn that on, and then everyone will get it, right? Because you don't need to mm -hmm. worry about the open web and whatnot, yeah. as much as I love the open web. But Focus Visible is re really neat, because I was able to make this drum machine in such a way that when you pressed on stuff in it with the mouse, you wouldn't see any focus outlines like you do when you click on something with a mouse 
where mm -hmm. focus, I mean, so for instance, on the smashing site, right, you've got those lovely big focus outlines, but you see them with a the mouse as well. Mm -hmm. So it's great that you've put them there oh, and customized on that. But with focus visible, the browser does some heuristics in the background, which kind of works out whether you're using a mouse or not. Uh, and if you if it thinks you're using a mouse, it won't show the focus outlines when you click on things. And if it thinks you are, then I can afford to have these enormous focus outlines, these really clear ones, because I didn't have to worry. And uh, so, so discovering some interesting, neat things about that. But it's um, the drum machine itself is conceptually different from other drum machines because it's a polymetric drum machine, which means that the different tracks you can have at different lengths. So you can have a uh, bass drum which is looped in five beats and a snare which is looped every eight beats in a uh right i think i lost you there right there. yeah <laughs> it's kind of yeah it's like having different time signatures in music but simultaneously okay so, that sounds <laughs> yeah. exciting that sounds exciting so please keep us up to date yeah sure um, oh and of course there's also every layout which i'm working on with yes. uh, andy bell um yeah. so i will be adding a new layout to that hoax so when people uh buy it when they subscribe to it they get infinite updates and the idea is that occasionally we will add a new layout to the to the roster of layouts so cool. there'll be a new one fairly soon hopefully. so you're busy you'll be busy yeah pretty busy okay. yeah uh, still working with the bbc um as i mentioned in the talk um on their on gel which is their design language and the accessible components there and uh yeah cool that's this it sounds, I, think, pretty sounds much. Nice. I think this is more than enough i think <laughs> yeah, this yeah. Point. Uh, well thank you so much hayden for sharing all the wonderful insights with us thank um, you. personally i must say that i'm really just happy and honored to be a part of this book process as well because i learned a lot <laughs> um, and so that was really really wonderful rich uh, experience for me um, beyond that dear friends who joined us today um, I hope it was a useful session for you as well. Thank you so much for meeting. Yes, thank you, you everyone for coming. And all the way that appreciate. late and you are probably in all the different parts of the world and all. Um, I'm looking forward to more, more coming up in the future. And in fact, we have some already reserved and planned and scheduled. And it's not Hayden. Uh, uh, well, I do like Hayden, but it's not I'm Hayden. <laughs> uh, we have um, Emma Bedekin joining us on November 12th, where we're going to chat oh, cool. about the building effective cross-cultural teams. And then we are going to have translating design wireframes into accessible HTML CSS with Harry Schneider, November 20th. Uh, and then we have Paul Bock uh, looking into how we can combine business metrics and privacy considerations and avoid horrible, horrible dark patterns in a session on encouraging clicks without shady tricks. And then we also have Rachel on December 3rd, Rachel Andrew, building a CSS layout live, kind of showing how she does things with CSS grid and Flexbox and when what fits and so on and so forth and more coming up as well. I wouldn't miss that one. That sounds great. Yeah, there is always so much going on. And there is Scott. Scott is back. Welcome back, Scott. Oh, hey, Scott. Is it cold outside, Scott? It's going to be. It's about minus 30 Celsius right now. Okay. What? Yeah. That's, that's cold. Yeah, I always have to smile when I see Scott and his wonderful background. <laughs> this, you know. But I think everybody is a little bit tired of us at this point. Scott, anything you want to share as a message to the world? Um, don't come to Canada right now. It's really cold. It sounds super cold, yeah. It's um, a very positive message. <laughs> and you, you beat me too, Vitaly. I was going to come and tell him, speak about the next webinars, but oh, you so did a great job. Yeah, I'm always doing these things, so always ruining for other people. <laughs> All right, but with this in mind, dear friend, thank you so much for joining. Looking forward to see you next time. And if you have a chance and you want to support this wonderful gentleman with the weird thing in the back, uh, <laughs> the book is out, the pre release is out, so you can actually start reading the ebook right away. Uh, we're printing the book as we speak, and we're going to start shipping it early December. And if you buy today, you gain, you're getting a nice little discount of 20% as well. We got it ready for Christmas, Vitaly. We managed Christmas, it. Christmas. <laughs> of course. Christmas. All right. With this in mind, thanks, everyone. Joy to the morning. world. <laughs> and I will talk to you soon, hopefully, with all of you. All of you. Uh, yes. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> all right. Bye-bye, everyone. Cheers. Bye. Thanks for joining. Bye. Thank you.